BBSing started off at the very end of the 1970s and peaked around the early to mid 90s. The explosive growth of the internet was a major reason for BBS's decline. The internet really took off for most people with the advent of the World Wide Web between around 1992 to 1996. Also at the same time, faster dial-up modem speeds such as 56k and the early broadband allowed people to connect in a different way than was available previously. All of a sudden, it was possible to transfer data that contained graphics and interactive text all at once. Either way, as the 20th century turned into the 21st and the new shiny graphics, broadband speeds and worldwide access to information grew up around us, for many, the draw of the internet was too much. For those of you out there who have never used a BBS before, I feel sorry for you. Interestingly though, BBSs never fully went away, and as I say, they're going under somewhat of a resurgence today, including users both young and old. Almost all of the BBSs available today are connected to the internet for anyone to access, which makes using a BBS in 2020 as easy as running an email app. This documentary series is about using BBSs in the modern day, but what was a bulletin board system? What was it like to use? Operated by enthusiasts at first, often operated out of someone's home, later a growing number operated as commercial systems that you'd pay a subscription fee for. Bulletin board software ran on all sorts of computers. The PC, Amiga, Commodore 64, take your pick, BBS software probably ran on it. To get connected to a BBS, you connected to it via a modem, which was connected to your phone line. You'd use what's called terminal software to dial up a BBS. BBSs had either multiple phone lines or in many cases, just one line, meaning that only one user could connect to it at any one time. You can imagine that dialing up BBSs that were outside of the local area code could lead to some pretty expensive phone bills. When users connected to a BBS for the first time ever, they could participate in a pre-internet online community. People could send and receive electronic mail, read news, join message groups, chat, share files, play games, and much more. Back in those days, many people didn't know that BBSs existed. Home computing wasn't like it is now, and using computers back then was a lot less user-friendly. Despite this, BBSing was, and still is, a heck of a lot of fun, and still has unique appeal. Don't take my word for it, listen to the interviews and watch the demos in this documentary and you'll probably see what I mean. There are many good reasons for people coming along to a BBS today and here's a few. Firstly, imagine being able to share with a tight-knit group of people who although may have diverse views are united by shared interests and hobbies. The beauty of it is that you're not being watched by any of the conglomerates like Google or Facebook. You're free to express yourself in the way that you want. Think of it as a community or a group of friends that you'd meet in the pub, rather than a sea of strangers on the net. Next up, you can participate in a worldwide electronic mail system and public message forum that's just for BBS users. This means more talk about the subjects that you're interested in and less spam and less noise. And yes, there's no advertising in there. You can also play unique online games on your own with other users of a BBS or in some cases, across multiple BBSs. There are lots of customized mods as well across many BBSs, giving them their own unique functionality and feel. And nowadays, many BBSs bridge the gap between the internet by presenting information on a BBS via web feeds. BBSs also provide file sharing repositories. Some of it is even BBS exclusive content. Some of it may be hard to find on the internet or potentially not even shared on the internet. On some BBSs, there's a bit of an underground feel to them. They have a look and feel that, for example, is kind of like you're in a subway filled of graffiti. These underground BBSs may provide content that you might not find lurking on the clear web. Not to say that they're nefarious, just that they have a feeling of not being, well, a PG-13 environment. A wonderful reason why BBSs have got such a great retro look is their artwork. A thing called ANSI art, which is effectively the use of extended text mode characters built up by a burgeoning scene of creativity that arguably hasn't been seen since the age of BBSs. 
people still make ANSI art today because of how unique it is. Finally, last but not least, there's that modern day internet dilemma. When you go to Google and type in climate change is, you're going to see different results depending on where you live and the particular things that Google knows about your interests. That's not by accident, that's a design technique. What I want people to know is that everything they're doing online is being watched, is being tracked. Every single action you take is carefully monitored and recorded. But not on BBSs. Have you felt yourself getting frustrated or disillusioned by living in a world of hyper-connectivity, which has become operated largely by conglomerates? Let's face it, the internet has now become an always pervasive system that makes its money through using you as data for advertising or some other, well, possibly sinister purposes. This may sound as dystopian as George Orwell's 1984. However, the reality is that our modern day currency is information, not cash. The more Facebook and Google get to know about us, the more money they make. Although privacy is a right that we should expect to have, yet it has been shown time and time again that the likes of Facebook, Google and Apple pay lip service to privacy. BBSs offer one of the few alternatives. Other than the BBSs in the darknet, there really isn't anywhere else that you can hide from spying eyes of these large corporations. When you log into a BBS, it's just for you and your friendly sysop and a bunch of other people that are like-minded to you. No money gets exchanged, no ads, and no flashing logos. So in summary, BBSs have a wonderful retro look and feel, but nowadays, many of them have all the relevance of the modern world. Think of the best bits of email, Usenet, Reddit, Facebook groups, file sharing like Dropbox or perhaps torrenting, and a few more bits besides. Package it all in one area and you have a BBS. People run BBSs today because they, by and large, are passionate about engaging in a community of people with similar ideals, something they won't get anywhere else. So that's a bunch of reasons why you might want to get into using BBSs. But I'm just scratching the surface here. The best thing to do is connect to one and try it for yourself. However, I'll demo a few BBSs throughout this documentary so you can get a general gist of what sort of experience you'll get when you log on to a good BBS. For the rest of this video, I'm gonna show you what BBSs were and how they've made a resurgence. You no longer need a modem and dial them up you can connect to them over the internet and it hasn't affected the experience at all. You'll see why using a BBS might just be up your alley if you've never used one before. And if you have used a BBS years ago and you're looking for something that will bring back the fun, then this documentary might spurn you on to get your lost carrier connected once again. For this video, I've interviewed sysops from some of the best BBSs out there and their passion for the current BBS scene is infectious. Stay tuned. If you have one of these, and you have one of these, but you don't have one of these, you're missing half the fun of owning a computer. This is a modem, and with it you can turn your computer into a window on the world. Back in the 90s as a teenager, I used to go on BBSs, and it was a lot of fun. You know, everything was cool and mysterious. Just being online and talking to people that you didn't know, though, was still a very new thing. And everyone had these edgy handles, and uh, it, was just, it was just a lot of fun, you know? And then, you know, time went on, and the internet meteor struck. Um, BBS has started disappearing. And then I started using internet browsers, getting more and more powerful PCs, left my Amiga behind. I mean, really. And then at some point, I didn't even realize it, but... But going online and the, the computer turned into a tool, you know? It turned it into a, a means to do something. And it lost that, that edge, and I, you know, I didn't even realize it. And I got older, and I started thinking back to my days with Amiga going onto BBSs. And it's like, you know what? I missed that. I missed that feeling. I missed that fun. I wonder if they're still around. Um, so I went online to see if they're out there, and holy cow! <laughs> There were still BBSs. I figured they'd all disappeared. And it just brought me right back. And it was such a different, you know, feeling from being on web forums or Facebook or whatever. And uh, so I stuck around. I, I called in a little more, started calling other boards. And then I started to get to know some of the people, you know? 
Like we just sit there and chat about all kinds of things. Started playing the games again. And uh, I just loved it so much. I suddenly got sucked into this complete other reality. Um, and it felt, it felt really like, I know, I, I didn't experience that feeling before. Um, and I guess going forward, like 20, 30 years, that's the feeling that I still get when I use them. And I just want people, other people, to be able to experience that kind of feeling as well. And do you feel like you can't get that feeling when you're on the internet? Well, it doesn't feel as, um, it doesn't feel as like personal, mm. you know, like on the internet, someone's website, you go to someone's website and you download a couple of files on the website. It just, I don't know, it just seems very anonymous. Mm. Whereas, whereas if you connect to someone's bulletin board, like traditionally the bulletin board was on their home computer in their kitchen or in their dining room, whatever, on a, on a table. Um, and you're actually in their house on their computer looking at their files. Mm. And it just felt, I don't know, it just felt um, clandestine. That was my drug. And that was what uh, kept me going in it. And I'm glad I never really, I mean, I spent quite a, few, quite a long time away from the scene since the internet came out. But um, I found my way back and I'm mm. glad I had. Because awesome. I get that feeling again now. I decided, okay, let me log into this. Let me try a few others. Let me just look. I see Telnet BBS guide. I try some to under, finally learn what Telnet is because I always wondered what that program was when I was a kid messing around in Windows 95. It's like, what is Telnet anyway? Get logged in, see all this text come up, see all this just, for lack of better phrasing, old school interface. I'm just like, oh, this is so nice. It was so, dare I say, warm feeling, comfortable, you know, because it was, it was raw and yeah, that's <laughs> kind of got hit, got hooked on it. Nowadays, you expect everything to work or everything's provided for you in a sense. And I feel like the human element um, ironically shows through in the technology more in that time than it does today. I don't know if maybe it was just a level of frustration with modern social media finally coming to a head, if it was just that's where my curiosity was taking me or what. I never quite know what drives me on these things, but I know what I like when I like it, like most people do. And um, they, they clicked with me. So you mentioned just briefly there an aspect of, you know, I guess disillusionment. Is that, a, is that a fair to say? Definitely. definitely. Yeah. So, so um, maybe could you just talk me through that? Why would you say that you felt a bit of disillusionment when you're, um, when you, you're starting to use social media. It's, it's a multitude of things. What happens is you eventually realize that no matter how much you try to close up your network, they're designed to force you out of whatever barrier you put yourself into. If you want to be kind of clustered up on Facebook, oh no, suggest this group, like this page, do this, do that. Then it entices you to converse. Twitter, unless you lock down your account, anything you post is out there broadcast for everybody. And what it boils down to is no matter how much you try to avoid it, the sites are by design, effectively everyone in the world sitting in the same room, all shouting simultaneously. There's no separation of different ideologies and mindsets. And I'm not saying everyone needs a particular space for stuff, but it's like you can't really be that bubble or be in that bubble that you used to be able to in pre-internet er, you know, era where you just walked and talked with friends. It was local groups or something. PBSs have that appeal because not only due to their geographic limitations historically, but even on the internet today, there's that barrier of, barrier of entry that keeps not everyone from wanting to get on them. And they require that bit of effort to where I have to work to maintain this, you know, both as a SysOp and as a user, I have to make an effort to get on the site. It's not, you know, sitting there embedded in my phone. So the kinds of people it will attract are the ones who seem to genuinely have their heart in it rather than any old person being able to just reply to whatever you post and start some, you know, some trouble. Between 1978 and 2001, it's estimated that over 100,000 BBSs existed in North America alone but BBSs were truly a worldwide phenomenon. More recently, in Taiwan, the PTT bulletin board system launched around 1995, which is very late in the timeline of BBSs. PTT has 1.5 million registered users to this day, and it has 150,000 users active during peak hours. 
the PTT system is a bit unique in that respect though. Today, the number of bulletin board systems worldwide is estimated to be in the low thousands. As already noted, bulletin board systems started off around the late 70s and blossomed to the 80s and early 90s. The only way to get online with anything back in those days was to use a modem. Today, most people have fibre optic broadband coming to their house. Back in the 20th century, you had to use a normal telephone line. If you were online and someone else picked up the telephone at the same time, you'd be cut off your online session. On top of that, the speeds were really slow. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, speeds ran from around 300 baud to around 56k. Baud meaning bits per second, a bit being a 1 or a 0. 300 baud, for example, would give you around 30 characters of text per second. The original BBSs were purely text-based, just for this reason. As modems grew faster, the capabilities of BBSs increased somewhat, but often maintained backwards compatibility for slower modems. Today, despite some BBSs still being available via the telephone line, this is mainly for nostalgia purposes. The way that we connect to BBSs today is via the internet protocols. Like the web uses HTTP protocol to transfer web pages, BBSs now run on top of the internet using Telnet or SSH connections. On the web, if you have a browser that's just a couple of years out of date, for example, or a version of Windows that's, well, just a few years old, chances are you're not going to be able to use the web, or at least to its fullest. You can't very well open up Internet Explorer 9 and expect it to work very well. Fortunately, no matter what the age of your computer, it's possible to get on a BBS. What's great about that is that pretty much every system out there comes with a Telnet client, or it can work with Telnet in some sort of way. Telnet itself is a very old protocol that yearns from back in the original days of the internet. And by the early days of the internet, I mean before the World Wide Web. RFC 854 was ratified in 1983. It wasn't until 1990 that the HTTP protocol for websites was defined and only ratified in 1996. It works just as well today as it did back in 1983. And guess what? Your PC still has a Telnet client. Windows, Mac and Linux, it's there. In recent versions of Windows, Microsoft have done a little bit to hide it, and you have to enable it, but it's still there. Believe it or not, through modern doohickeys, you can even get old computers like the Commodore 64 or the Amiga onto a BBS just using Telnet. More on that later. Despite being able to use the stock standard Telnet client and terminal that comes with Windows, Mac or Linux, they're not ideal. The reason that they're not ideal is because of something called ANSI text. The stock Telnet clients that come with your PC are just fine when it comes to displaying plain old text. That's ASCII. However, when BBSs started getting a bit more interesting, people found that they could use an extended version of ASCII which was present on IBM PCs. ANSI, or DOS Code Page 437, is a set of extra characters above the usual 128 ASCII characters that we all know. It allowed the text screen to do things like position the cursor in different locations at any time rather than just do top to bottom. It also allowed for a colour palette of 16 foreground and 16 background colours. Most fundamentally, however, it provided a number of extra characters that included things like smiley faces, box characters and so forth. The original designers of it had likely envisaged people using it to make menus and things like that. Menus with a bit more panache than just simple black and white text. I dare say that it probably came as somewhat of a surprise to the inventors of ANSI text standards that it would blow up into some sort of massive world of text-based graphics, mostly spawned from the BBS scene. I'll talk more about this later, however if you want the best experience of a BBS and on all of its ANSI graphics glory, then you'll need a Telnet client that supports code page 437, ANSI. The easiest way to do that is to download a free app called SyncTerm or Netrunner. Now, there are other apps out there, but SyncTerm seems to be the most popular, and it's available for Mac, Windows, and Linux, so I'd go with that for the best experience. The download link is in the description. Although you should use an app such as SyncTerm, you'll notice on sites like the Telnet BBS Guide, you can actually connect to many BBSs from within your web browser. Whilst it's a quick and easy way to get onto a BBS, there are some limits such as not being able to download files as easily, so I'd still recommend using a dedicated Telnet or SSH client that handles ANSI because then you'll get the real immersive experience. 
So now that we've got you started out with an ANSI capable telnet client, you can dive right on in. But where do we start? Fortunately, there are a number of excellent websites out there which will help you find a BBS to connect to. Firstly, there's the Telnet BBS guide, and then there's the IPTIA BBS resource site. These are just two popular ones, there's a bunch more. But these are certainly more of the comprehensive ones. There's also a bunch of BBS groups on Facebook, as well as on Reddit and Twitter to help you get started. So armed with all of the information that I've just given you, it's about time that we went on to a BBS and I showed you how to get online with one of them. So we'll start off with the Telnet BBS guide. I'll find a few BBSs on there that exemplify something which I find is a good BBS. First off, you can use a brief list or a detailed list. This here is the brief list and you can see the different names of BBSs and their Telnet address. You can also click on the Telnet, Modem or SSH buttons up the top. Modem means just that, it means dialing up with a really old school modem on a telephone line. And SSH is the encrypted version, the modern day version I guess of Telnet, which allows all the transfer of information between your computer and the BBS to be secure. It is important to note, however, that the majority of BBSs to date still only offer Telnet connectivity. Looking here then at the more detailed descriptions of BBSs, you can see there are plenty to choose from. Some of them have really good details. This one here is called the Bottomless Abyss BBS. Hi, my name is, uh, well, I go by Stack4. Uh, my name is uh, Dave Clutier, actually. And uh, I'm based in uh, Quebec City. Uh, I'm involved in a security um, event here that is called ACFEST, which is uh, one of the largest security events in, in Canada, actually. And it, you can compare it a little bit to DEF CON in, 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 in the States, but to a scale that is equal to the Canada, which is much smaller. If you are into security, either being training, either being um, uh, hacking challenges, news, Whatever, the bottom list of this is definitely your spot on the BBS side of things. Uh, so everything is in there. The contest is, is running very well. And we have extra, very good prizes. Uh, for example, uh, uh, we have lifetime access to the Hackfest. We have uh, swag. We have a lot of real stuff. So you, can have, you get real things when you win the contest. It's not just... Yeah, we, we're happy you're there. So you have real prizes. But the biggest win is definitely the knowledge and the fun and the community and the sharing of information with other people. Uh, and you get to learn something new uh, as, as we go. So BBS is not something that most of the younger uh, generations know about. Many, many users I had last year, for example, was the first time they actually dialed into a BBS. And they loved it. And they still dial today. So the bottom list of this is definitely security and privacy oriented. Yeah. If you're interested, uh, that's, a, that's a good place to start, definitely is. It's a really fantastic BBS, which has a completely unique niche for users. There's IT security training materials, there's ham radio information, there's up to the minute hacking news on ARACnet. On top of all of this, the BBS has a large participation in something called the MRC chat or the multi relay chat. It brings over 60 BBSs together where their users can all chat at the same time in the chat room. There's a big get together every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So you can see from the guide here that the BBS is available on both Telnet and SSH and it uses the BBS software Mystic. It's important to note that the port numbers here for Telnet and SSH are not the standard Telnet ports. Telnet is usually on port 23 and also SSH is usually on port 22. So you can see that they've been changed here. This is mainly to protect the BBS from bots connecting to SSH and Telnet ports on their standard ports. It just means when you go into sync term or something like that, that you need to change the port number to match. 
So you can see here I've downloaded and installed the sync term client. So I'm going to press insert for the insert item option. And once that happens, you can type any old name for the BBS that you want to connect to. So I'll just type in uh, bottomless abyss. Once I've done that, then you can check the connection type. And in this case, we want to choose Telnet, but you can see that there's uh, SSH and others ones as well there. Now I'm just going to take the name from the Telnet BBS guide, the host name that is. So bbs.bottomlessabyss.org net and the next thing I need to do is press F2 edit item the reason I need to do that is because the default telnet port as I said earlier is not in use so this BBS doesn't run on port 23 it runs on 2023 and you can put in a few other things in here as well like your name your username and password for the BBS that doesn't often work, so I just leave it empty. But this one here, hide status line, is quite helpful because otherwise you get that sort of blue bar at the bottom of your screen, and sometimes that can affect the uh, the way that the BBS is supposed to look. So I've done that. I pressed OK uh, or hit return on it, and then I'm connecting up to the BBS. And as you can see, it's as simple as that. As I'm using a proper client sync term here, I just choose code page 437, which is ANSI. This is a cool little mod which checks to see if I'm a baddie. It's called Threat Sentry and was made by the sysop here, Stackfault. I'm going to log in with my account here, which I've already created. Obviously, if you didn't have an account, you would just hit return and it would create a new account. It says, do I want to log in invisibly for extra security? I'll say no and I'll log in. I should point out that this is the slow login way. You can also choose at the beginning there an ultra fast login method, but I thought I'd show you the full login of this BBS in all of its glory, like this wonderful ANSI title screen, as you can see scrolling past there, the bottomless abyss. Once you get past all the ANSI, it then gives you some statistics about your last logons. I've been on this BBS 16 times, it tells me, and how many files I've downloaded, emails sent, and messages posted, for example. There's some more ANSI about all of the other BBSs and affiliations this particular BBS has. Uh, for example, it's the official home of the Hackfest. The BBS is also on Facebook. It's got a Facebook page that you can go and like. Once you get through all of the title information, it then tells you about all the bulletins that you can read. And there's three new bulletins for me. The ones identified with stars beside them are the new ones here. So I can press B or C or R for those relevant ones. So here, for example, are the BBS announcements. The ones with stars again are the new ones. So the yearly contest countdown has begun. This is for the Hackfest, where people go along and capture the flag and other things like that. Exiting out of the bulletins menu then brings me to a scan for new files. So if you want to see if there's new files since your last visit to the BBS, it will show you the latest additions to the file base of the BBS here. And you can see that there's some ANSI artwork that's been uploaded. It's fairly typical after that to see if your BBS has any new messages waiting for you. And as you can see here, nobody loves me. I'm not very popular. This, uh, this particular BBS has this um, news a bot, I think it's a feed that downloads certain security information news from the internet and displays it here, which is pretty handy. It's pretty unique. So then after all of that, you're presented finally with the main menu. And as you can see here, there are, well, six main options. There's M for messages, F for files, there's E for events and contests, there's D for door games, communication C, and then finally settings and stats. And you can see a sort of summary of the other things that are available through each of those particular areas. This is the messages menu, and as you can see, there's plenty of options here, but I'm gonna choose indexed lister, which is just an easy to use message lister. So this list here shows you all of the message bases on this BBS. First of all, the ones are local to the machine. So for example, there's a contest chat and so forth. This one here is just the general lounge. Here's just an example of me looking through a message and, uh, and then looking through the thread of the reply to it. As we scroll on down, there's more specialist areas on there about hacking and security. And then there's this, the FSX net, which is a separate network. These are messages which are shared across all of the BBSs which so happen to be subscribed to the FSX network. More about this later. I thought I'd just take this opportunity to write a quick email to the sysop and tell them what I was up to.
So after I sent a little message on to Stackfault to wish him well, I thought I'd go back to the main menu and look at some other forms of communication on this BBS. There's this communication menu and there's an option here, M, for multi-relay chat. And uh, multi-relay chat is something pretty cool that uh, allows you to chat between different bulletin board systems that are all subscribed to this MRC, multi-relay chat. It's a fantastic little system. It kind of works like any normal chat room, really. There's a number of different chat rooms that you can go to, and this one's kind of just like the lobby. And you can see here that straight away somebody called Agent037 is in here, and he's just said hello to me. So uh, it's, it's really great. He is on a different BB. BBS, as you can see there, he's on the central headquarters BBS, and obviously I'm logged in here on the bottomless abyss. Back of the menu here, H is the Hackfest menu for the comms area, and it allows you to connect to the Slack gateway for the Hackfest competition. Slack, of course, if you know, is a very modern internet-based instant messaging client and uh, used by workplaces all over the world, and so it's completely up to date, and this here connects our BBS to the Hackfest Slack channel. Heading back onto the main menu then, we'll go to the files menu where you can also find technical training and some other downloads besides. I'm not gonna spend an awful lot of time here, but I'll look at the file groups and the file indexer, and you can see all the different types of local areas of um, files. There's books and there's art and underground and there's old school and all sorts of stuff here. So you can choose a particular area. Here's the local area called Mags Technical. So there's technical magazines here. And the first one is the 2600 one. So I've gone and chosen the area 2600 magazine and now I'm taking a listing of the files within that particular area and you can see this one here has every single episode or, or volume I guess of the 2600 magazine uh, from 1984 all the way up to present day so you can download them to your heart's content you can see here that you get the option to use Z modem, Y modem and also HTTPS via URL and most people will probably decide to download via HTTPS because it's faster and it's also easier. There are loads of other great things in this BBS including a bunch of games as well. There's um, this Ambrosia game which is a sort of role playing game where you go through uh, a realm and it's, it's pretty much text based. It's a sort of role playing game where you get to create your own character, uh, build your own capabilities, fight and do all sorts of stuff like that. So it was quite good fun, I played it for a while. Also in fitting with the uh, sort of hacker theme of this particular BBS, there's a game called Hackers Cyber City. And uh, yes, it seemed again quite a good fun game to play. Um, this one has the added dynamic of the fact that you can get a kind of move around your character and interact with people um, in a bit more of a graphical way if, uh, if this is what you consider graphics to be. But certainly uh, it seemed like uh, quite a good game. So there you go, that's a demonstration of one of the first BBSs, uh, The Bottomless Abyss. For more details on this particular BBS, you can head over on the web to bbs.bottomlessabyss.net. My name's Subi. Uh, new to BBSing, about started like two weeks ago. From Wow, and, and how old are you, Subi? Uh, soon to be 16. What? <laughs> 15 years old and you've just discovered BBSs for the first time. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so I detect a little bit of an accent there. Where about in the world are you from? Uh, I'm from Serbia, so that's a bit of a Slavic accent. Europe, Balkan. How did you find out about BBSs? Uh, it was a pure accident, actually. Uh, so I'm hanging out on Reddit and a random ad pops up for r slash BBS. And I joined it, I didn't know what it was even, and then I let it rest for like five months maybe. <laughs> and after I, I was going through my subscriptions and I saw Arsalash BBS, what is this? And I saw it was something of a retro thing. And, huh, I never seen this before, so let me try. Downloaded SyncTerm, joined a few BBSs, and from there I just kind of went on. Can you talk a bit about your, your first experience with the BBS? Uh, it was, uh, I've been on different sides of the internet for a different time, but I've never been on the old internet. Uh, and BBSing, uh, because uh, my PC used to crash a lot, it looked like those menus that you go in a lot. So it kind of 
it was easy to navigate, uh, logging in, everything. Everything was on the screen, so it was not a problem. Joined, and mass, it's simple, really. Uh, it was like discovering something new, but it was old. <laughs> uh, like having a nostalgia you didn't know you have. Uh, what's your What's your favorite BBS? Uh, Quantum Wormhole. Why uh, particularly do you like that BBS? Just uh, I mean, it could be any BBS, but why particularly? Uh, it could be. Uh, it uh, It was much more organized than uh, some I was on, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I usually just frequent there. It's easier for me to read messages, switch groups, and stuff like that. And it's always a surprise to see if somebody answered your message or anything. You don't you don't get notifications. You have to log on. You have to go through the process of looking through all the good as NCR before going into the main board, then on messages, then new message scan and stuff like that. It's really anticipation and stuff like that that really brings me back. Like sending a letter. Due to uh, BPSing, uh, is it's a really good thing to join in a community of people that are a bit out of my age range, but like the uh, it's a great community to join into in any stage of life because everybody's open, welcome, willing to help and talk. I mean, there is art community. Now I found about the demo scene, so I have to go through a lot of stuff about it, and there's a lot of stuff for people who want to explore, want to meet new people. There's a ton. Hi, my name is Dave Purcell. I am the sysop of the Diamond Mine Online BBS in Fredericksburg, Virginia. I've been a BBS user since 1991. I've been a BBS sysop since 1993. Uh, I also run the BBS Corner since 1996 and the Telnet BBS Guide uh, starting in 1997. You know, in the 90s, we didn't know if BBSs were even going to survive uh, past, say, 96, 97, 98, that sort of deal. You know, the dial-up BBS as we knew it, moving into the Internet age, was just basically going to say, hey, uh, we're just going to go away. Is there going to be anything to survive moving forward? And there was a, the uh, transition period, as I like to call it, to go say, hey, how can we take what we knew, this online community thing that people would dial into and they should say, would this be an internet destination? And I'm glad to say that obviously, you know, here in 2020, basically it's trying to say, hey, yes, we actually survived and not only survived, we're thriving, but in a new direction. And I think that's one of the things we wanted to say, BBSs provide variety. And it's one of those things where I found out saying, hey, you have different people, different uh, sysops that basically have their own ideas and visions of how they want to do things. There's like maybe a handful of different kinds of BBS software, but how each individual sysop configures it is what makes BBS unique in my opinion. Somebody asked me, why did I call the board absinthe? Well, because I actually drink absinthe. <laughs> <laughs> like too much of it actually, so cheers. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so uh, one of the biggest highlights is internet downloading. So we offer internet downloads in addition to the usual terminal protocols, um, which is a first for Amiga BBSs. We're the only Amiga BBS with that out there. And it's very rare for BBSs in general still. There are only a few that I know of that offer internet downloads. So for those that don't know, doing a, a normal download with Z modem or wide modem uh, through your terminal takes forever. I mean, they're, they're pre-internet speeds. Um, but now if there's a PDF or video or game, um, you can actually have Absence to generate a link directly to the Absence server for you. So it's, it's very cool. Also, um, we're actually being developed. I mean, Al, it's changed, what, five, six times since you were here last week? Um, so there's always something new to see. Um, it's definitely not stagnant. Um, we have a powerful custom news interface that I invented, and it helps you keep track of everything. So if you're wondering what's going on, what's new, what's changed, you can go in this interface that's very intuitive and see exactly what's been happening by date, by category. We have killer art from the top text mode artists in the scene. So artists like Prismate, Smooth, Jack Flash, myself, uh, in addition to classic line art from the 90s that still holds up. Um, so it has a really cool, edgy look. We keep it fresh. We have new games, uh, some exclusive that I haven't released yet, like Sky Raiders. Um, we have Halls of the Dwarven Kings. We have, we have a bunch of cool stuff. 
Um, and there's some games that you won't find anywhere else. We have a built-in text mode browser, uh, links that you can access through the BBS. So you can browse either the web via text or Gopher, Gopher space, that's still a thing. We have an active local message base with networked message bases as well. Um, so the users are constantly in there, uh, posting new topics, responding. Um, through the network boards, we're interfaced with many other BBSs as well. We have active members, we have good traffic. Um, a dead board is a depressing board. So, but we have people logging in, people staying active. Um, so yeah, so that's a quick rundown of Absinthe. Um, we're just, we're doing new things, creating new things, always keeping it fresh. Um, so it's not something stagnant. So you can stop by for some nostalgia, but the stay, because there's some cool stuff happening. Uh, it's, a, it's a fun hobby of mine, I really enjoy it. So I hope some of you guys come by and check it out. That's a very, very talented and um, dedicated community in, in, in the BBS world. People have been doing it for years and years and years. And they are committed to it and they are putting a lot of effort. And it's, it's not something that you see a lot in other things people are actually trying it for a while and then go back go out and you never hear from them anymore bbs is, is a little bit more there is that our core of people that actually stay as there and are, have been around for 30 years what would i say to someone want to get into today um come for the community honestly i mean when i was looking up bbs's to see if they were still out there i had this image of these like you know old last man standing man on the mountains with six foot beards you know kind of image but then and there are those guys out there don't let me fool you um but then when i got into it i found this awesome community of artists coders and his misfits they were just doing cool stuff um you know they they were they were hip they were doing edgy things um it wasn't this this old musty environment i thought it was it was really exciting but the community is what, what really was is what really is a draw and the reason why is because it's a small community. There are not a lot of us out there, you know, which is really cool. So you can form like real relationships. And it's not like the internet where everyone is just screaming and vying for attention and doing clickbait on, on Facebook, you know. If someone starts a conversation with you in the BBS world, you're gonna have a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and also, due to its, its nature, um, people tend to be more polite, but also uh, you have much more of an eclectic group. You have people of all walks of life. So all these different people and since they're all forced to be in this little ass scene that we have you end up being polite and actually talking to each other you know and that's something that, that's really cool and i think it's missing from the internet right now join me in part two of this documentary to find out about ansi art the worlds of bbs messaging sysops games and modifications and later the demo scene the tracker music scene the bbs underground server software and retro computer hardware for BBSs. That's all coming up on Back to the BBS, the return to being online.